Okay, I'm reviewing another prison memoir today. I guess strictly speaking, it's not a prison memoir because it wasn't written by someone in prison, but it was written by the brother of someone in prison who went to visit him on a regular basis and told his story impressively, I think, very often through his brother's voice. The book is Brothers and Keepers by John Edgar Wideman. It was first published in 1984. Then it came out, a 20th anniversary edition came out in, I think, 2005 with a new preface by the author. The preface is as good as anything in the book, in my opinion. And if you buy the Scribner's edition that came out in 2020, it includes a an afterward by the writer's brother, who, after almost 44 years in prison, um, had his life without parole sentence pardoned by the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolfe, in 2019. What was Robbie Weidman in prison for? Well, in 1975, when he was 24 years old, um, he was involved in the homicide of a guy named Nicola Morena um, in Pittsburgh after a, let's say, um, robbery between small-time crooks went bad. Um, it, Robbie Weidman wasn't the shooter, and some people say there was medical malfeasance afterwards, but uh, nonetheless, that was what he was in prison for. Um, for life. Um, and I think probably uh, Brothers and Keepers most likely had an effect on the sentence being commuted because it brought the issue to national attention in 1984 and then again in 2000 and, and um, I guess 2005. Um, the book is many things, but among other things, it is a searing criticism of the American penal system um, uh, for how it humiliates and dehumanizes not only prisoners, but also visitors, the loved ones visiting the prisoners. At one point, uh, John Edgar Wideman writes how uh, the visitor is forced to become an inmate and how um, the penal system operates in a fashion that creates as many problems for society as it solves. Who is John Edgar Wideman? Well, he is, I would say, a consecrated American novelist, short story writer, essayist, uh, memoirist, journalist. I first came across him in late 1990 because of an excellent feature piece that he wrote on Michael Jordan for The New Yorker. Really, it's a memorable feature piece. Um, perhaps he is, he writes mainly about the African American condition. Perhaps he's most famous for what's called the Homewood Trilogy. Homewood is a, a black neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh. The Homewood Trilogy, I think, is made up of two novels. One is called um, Hiding Place. The other, the, the other one is called Sent For You Yesterday. And also there is a collection of short stories called Dambala in that uh, trilogy. He's still alive. I think he was born in 1941, so I think he's in his 80s. He must be in his 80s. Um, he was, he's a very interesting guy. He was, he went to Penn, was the captain of the basketball team there, Phi Beta Kappa, all Ivy League team. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Europe and I think played in Europe with Bill Bradley, the former Nick and uh, U.S. Senator. Um, his daughter Jamila, mm, who went to Stanford, became a WNBA star. And his son, Jacob, tragically um, killed his friend, uh, stabbing him to death when they were both 16 years old. I guess John Edgar Wideman writes a little bit about this. Jacob is mentioned, at least in the preface to this book, but he also writes about him in his novel, Philadelphia Fire, I've heard. I don't know. I think there were mental issues with his son. His son is now serving a, 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 a prison sentence. He's in for life uh, in Arizona mm, right now. So, uh, yeah, he's a fascinating guy. He's very articulate in the book. 
um, and dramatizes very well, I would say, black rebellion, black wariness, rage, hopelessness. John Edgar Wideman is very matter-of-fact about, about racial injustice, I would say. He doesn't throw it in the reader's face. He just speaks about it as a part of his life, undeniable, something he deals with on a regular basis. One of the things that gives this commentary and dramatization more authority is how the book is a kind of self-reckoning. He's tremendously hard on himself as far as, his in, uh, as far as his injustice and betrayal to others, especially to loved ones. Um, perhaps first and foremost, at least in this book, to his brother, who is 10 years younger. Um, he writes about how, um, well, let me say first that one of the things that John Edgar Wyman does very well in this book is that he is able to vary the voice in many ways. Sometimes he's writing straight classic memoir. Other times he falls into black vernacular. Sometimes he writes directly to his brother. Sometimes he enters into his brother's voice in black vernacular. At one point when he's sort of writing to his brother, he says, your words and gestures belong to a language that I was trying to teach myself to unlearn. He also says, um, the measure of my success was the distance I put between us. Also, John Edgar Wideman talks about how, you know, he has to, he doesn't want to turn his back on uh, the culture he was raised in. So he says, um, I needed to prove I hadn't lost my roots, claim my turf, wear it like a badge, yet keep my distance to be in the streets, but not of it. Okay, so he kind of, you get the sense that he pushed his brother away. You know, one of the things this book is, uh, in addition to being a, seri uh, a searing criticism of the American penal system, is it's also a book on, I'd say, fraternal love. Um, he talks about how, you know, mm, these visits he, he takes to the prison, how they have a three hour limit. But he writes the, about the irony of, it was the first time in life we'd ever talked this long, or it took guards, locks, and bars to bring us together. You know, what sticks in a literary masterpiece? What makes it stick? What makes us remember it, right? You know, early on in this book, John Edgar Wideman makes a decision. He is trying to show the reader sort of the process that he has to go through to visit his brother. Like, you know, collecting the entire family for the visit, you know, passing through the streets of Homewood, um, uh, you know, all the different milestones on the nondescript highway on the way to the prison, where he parked when he got to the prison, passing through the controls, the waiting room, the boredom, all of this stuff. As a reader, I sometimes said, you know, maybe he's going on a bit long here. Also, he can be at times obtuse, his writing style. He writes his, the metaphors, he writes abstractly, very conceptually at times. But you kind of wonder if he is kind of demanding a certain commitment from the reader so that it sticks. Like when I go through this book, right, when I try to remember, Certainly, this trip to the prison, what steeled him for the dehumanizing feeling of becoming an inmate as a visitor, right? That was not my favorite part of the book, but nonetheless, it's the part that I would say I remember the most. You know, Norman Mailer wrote about this, I think, in Advertisements for Myself, how the literary writer has to make a decision in how much he entertains the reader and how much he kind of, um, let's just say, teaches the reader, you know, gives the reader something to um, grow with or grow on or to sort of expand his views with, okay? And um, yeah, because it's not as though John Edgar Wyman is incapable of entertaining us. He is a tremendously entertaining and sophisticated storyteller. Like he'll, 
jump forward in time to give a detail about something, then go back and fill in the details. He makes it seem effortless. He's great when he gets into his brother's voice. It's a tremendously authentic voice. To me, that was the part that I enjoyed the most, okay, where he you know, describes Robbie's upbringing through Robbie's voice. He describes Robbie's relationship with his mother and father. He describes how Robbie wanted to carve his own path, a path other than the siblings, a more rebellious path, how he fell into drugs, his penchant for partying, ultimately the, the way his sort of small-time scams fell to pieces, the disappointment of that, how he dealt with all that, how he made sense of it. You know, so he's totally capable of gripping us as a narrator. But there are times he decides not to do that. And um, I think it's a bold risk to take as a writer. You have to be a master of the craft. Only the greats can do it. But nonetheless, you're grateful for it afterwards because you do walk away with more as a reader. It's not a throwaway book by any means, you know. You know, also, there are a couple of lines I want to sort of share with you. There's one line about Pittsburgh. He describes it as a city strewn like litter over precipitous hills. I mean, that has to be up there among the best one-liners, descriptive one-liners about cities. Also, check out this line. I think it's in his brother's voice. Mm. But just so you get a sense of what he's capable of as far as voice goes, John Edgar Wideman. He says, he writes, it had been a stuttering stop start, maybe, fuck it bitch of a summer, and now for better or worse, we were starting up something else, right? Do you see what I mean by how he just can, that sentence is packed with voice, packed with rhythm, also, there are little nuggets of wisdom that sort of add to the experience. Like there's one line where he says, about the only thing whites didn't do to black music was destroy it. Or another one where he says, nothing can stand up to close examination or everybody wants to be a star. That wish contains the best of us and the worst. Okay? so. This book has a tremendous amount to offer. There are places maybe when he's talking about the craft of the book that he's writing. This book, perhaps I thought it was excess. I wasn't really so interested when he was talking about the decisions or challenges of writing this type of book. Um, also, perhaps I question the decision of him putting his brother's poetry in the book near the end. It's not a lot of the poetry, but I think, you know, John Edgar Wideman is the professional writer. He should have just left us with Robbie's voice, which he captured so well. He shouldn't have put the guy's poetry in the book, but maybe he felt obligated. Um, just, you know, a book that sticks to your ribs for the reasons that I say. His masterly and bold and brave decision to make us work a bit with his text so that we could get more out of it. Mm, impressive, yeah. Second prison memoir I'm, I'm recommending extremely highly. Check it out.